everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience. Well, uh, welcome to George Mason University School of Law and to the Immigrant Outreach Committee's uh, first installment of its Pro Bono CLE series, Understanding Affirmative Asylum and Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Giovanni DiMaggio. I'm the Northern Virginia Chair of the Immigrant Outreach Committee. Uh, and I'm so pleased to see all of you here today. Thank you for uh, attending the reschedule of the original. Um, we're here today because there's a justice gap in Virginia, uh, as well as nationwide, for that matter, in representation of individuals, uh, families, and children who have entered our country, many fleeing persecution in their home country or the risk of persecution in their home country. Our goal is to narrow that justice gap by increasing the number of attorneys providing pro bono uh, representation in immigration-related matters. And our means to that end is the Pro Bono CLE series, which aims to educate Virginia attorneys on relevant topics in immigration law, so as to encourage and promote your participation in pro bono immigration work. Uh, in this first installment of the Pro Bono CLE series, we had initially aimed to begin with a small training on affirmative asylum only, uh, that is, the process of applying for asylum before removal proceedings have begun, to be followed by a training on uh, seeking you know, relief from removal after removal proceedings have begun. Uh, however, due to the significant increase in um, border crossings by unaccompanied minors in, uh, in the recent past, especially in 2014, which has dipped a, a little bit in recent uh, months, but is forecasted to rise again in the summer, uh, we thought it would be imp imperative to add a special immigrant juvenile status to, to the CLE, um, as it's, it's a timely and important issue. Uh, as you'll hear in more detail shortly, uh, it's well settled that the success rate of um, an individual in immigration proceedings is exponentially greater when they enjoy the benefit of legal representation. And so we hope that today's training will inspire you to take your next or perhaps your first uh, pro bono immigration case, uh, thereby help to narrow the justice gap in Virginia and uh, give an individual, family, or perhaps unaccompanied minor a fighting chance. Uh, with that, I'd like to briefly introduce our esteemed faculty of panelists here in order that they'll be appearing, and then we'll get started with the uh, presentations. Uh, you'll be hearing first from Carl Doss, who's the director of the Virginia State Bar Special Committee on Access to Legal Services. He'll be presenting on the justice gap in Virginia and the rules of professional conduct governing pro bono. You'll next hear from Rachel Peterson, who's a founding member of Zeman and Peterson, and she'll be providing an overview of the immigration system as well as explaining where asylum and SIJS uh, fit into the big picture. Um, Mary, Mari Doran Lopez, Doran Lopez excuse me, will be uh, presenting on SIJS and uh, best practices for working with unaccompanied minors. And she's a supervising attorney at CARE Coalition. Uh, Karen Guise will be uh, presenting on the ethical considerations of representing unaccompanied minors. She's Public Service Counsel at Freed Frank and Special Advisor to the ABA Commission on Immigration. Corey Hash will be joining us uh, later this, this afternoon. She's a staff attorney at Human Rights First, and she'll be presenting on the affirmative asylum aspect of the, of the uh, CLE. And finally, we'll conclude with Daida Bindi Ahmed, who is a junior partner at Fine Law, and she'll be presenting on um, the asylum interview process. Uh, and with that, Carl, you can have the floor. handout for you. It is our pro bono brochure 
I will make sure that uh, these get distributed and have some up there. And also, I wanted to would encourage you all, if you had not already looked at it, in October of last year, the Virginia lawyer did a special issue on pro bono and access to justice issues in Virginia. And there is an article on page 16 on SIJS. And so it's a really good place to start. You all, again, probably know more about this than I do. I certainly hope you do. But the fact is, is I'm sure your colleagues, many of them don't. And to make sure to at least get them to understand the issues that are involved here and the need, please encourage them to take a look at this issue. If you don't have it, please contact me. I've got boxes full of them in my office, so it's like I have plenty to hand out. So with that, let's uh, proceed. Um, I've done this presentation a number of times. I've got different versions of it. I've got a five minute version. I've got an hour and a half version. Uh, you get kind of the intermediate version of it. But this is what we'll be covering during this. We'll talk about the justice gap. What is it? We'll talk about why legal representation makes a difference. We'll talk about the issues and the challenges that legal aid is facing right now. We'll then look at the ethical rules concerning pro bono and uh, finally focus in on uh, what's going on here in Virginia. So the justice gap, what is it? Basically, it's a difference between the legal assistance and representation that's available versus what's needed to meet the needs of low-income Americans. Surveys, studies are all consistent. Basically, 80% of the legal needs of the poor go unmet in America. And there's three studies right there that are cited. Moreover, again, nationwide, Statistics surveys all show the same thing, that the perception of how the poor are treated in the court system are consistently bad. They're the worst of any group that you look at. If you look at you know, men, women, African Americans, Hispanics, non-English speakers, the poor, over 50% of folks say that they are treated much worse or so much, somewhat worse than the average person. So when it comes to the crisis, when it comes to pro bono and access to justice, clearly we've got an issue where 80% of the needs are being met. We've got the issue of the poor being treated in the court system worse than anybody else. But why is that important when it comes to the issue of legal representation? First of all, it should come to no surprise to any of us that folks who are represented by counsel fare better than folks who represent themselves. But if you look at particularly different types of cases, the, the, the difference is actually stunning. You look at landlord-tenant cases. Basically, represented tenants fare twice as well as those who don't have legal representation. In custody cases, the party who is represented by counsel usually prevails, at least in some sort of custody award by the court, whether it's sole custody or joint custody. A party who's represented is going, in all likelihood, will end up with a more favorable outcome than the unrepresented party. And whether it's the mother or the father, it really doesn't matter. Mothers typically fare better in custody outcomes, but fathers who are represented by counsel, even when both parties are represented, do better than if they're representing themselves. Other types of cases, social security appeals. You can see the favorable outcome for represented litigants, 60 to 78 percent. You know, unemployment claims, almost half. Immigration and asylum cases of interest here, you know, again, 39 percent for non-detained, 18 percent for detained. That may not seem all that high, but look at it compared to the unrepresented litigants. 14 percent versus 3 percent. So you're talking about three to five times more likely to a litigant who's represented uh, by counsel is more likely to have a favorable outcome, again, if they're represented by counsel. And the suspension of deportation, I mean, again, not detained 62% versus 17% of those who are the uh, uh, clients or the parties who are unrepresented in uh, these types of hearings. So it, it's, it does make a definite difference. 
So why am I here pitching pro bono? Because legal aid is not enough. In 2012, the World Justice Project did a study of the rule of law index concerning access to legal services. And one would think that the US would fare really well on this index, but we ranked 68,097 that were surveyed. In fact, we rated worse than Russia, than Ukraine. You know, I will say that we uh, did end up better than Nepal, but clearly, you know, there are, when it comes to access to legal assistance in this country, we are far cry from many nations that we tend to say that we're better than. If you look at government spending on legal services for the poor, Again, nations that we consider ourselves, you know, rivals of or, or, or allies of, England, ne the Netherlands, Germany, France, all spend more per capita than we do on civil legal services. In the last 30 years, funding for legal services through the LSC has significantly decreased. The, not only the funding, but the appropriation itself, uh, the dollars have just steeply declined, and they still are declining. Additionally, IOLTA was a source of revenue for legal aid offices in Virginia, but as you can see by the chart there, that that is pretty much flatlined to, you know, just a fraction of what it was in 2006. When it comes to the attorney crisis, the lack of representation, available representation for the poor, if you look at our population, the number of attorneys versus uh, the overall population in Virginia, there are 349 attorneys or people for each lawyer in Virginia. But when it comes to the poverty population, that number skyrockets to 6,184 poor persons for each legal aid lawyer. So what does all this mean? You look at basically the uh, decrease, significant decrease in uh, LSC funding. You look at the basic collapse of IOLTA funding. This has all resulted in legal aid offices over the past five years laying off approximately 20% of their staff. That's huge. That's attorneys, that's staff, it's 20%. Over the same period of time, the poverty population in Virginia has increased by 32%. So, is there a crisis in Virginia? Absolutely. So let's talk about pro bono and the rules. Rule 6.1 of the Rules of Professional Conduct in the AB model rule basically set forth the same thing, is that it is incumbent upon lawyers to help provide legal representation for people who cannot afford here. Our Rule 6.1 provides that lawyers should render at least 2% per year of their professional time in some sort of pro bono service, and that pro bono service includes poverty law, it includes civil rights law, it includes public interest law, and it includes voluntary activities that are designed to increase the availability of pro bono. I would note that the rule says that in those organizations or firms or offices where you have multiple attorneys, they can do this or meet this responsibility collectively. Basically, you know, how a lot of times big firms may do is that they may have their new attorneys come in and provide the pro bono assistance and do that representation for the firm. It all works out. It's all good. Speaking on behalf of the bar, we're not picky. We're, we will take it however we can get it. Virginia also offers the opportunity or the option for those folks who do not have the time or the opportunity to do pro bono to basically do what we have deemed checkbook pro bono. In other words, you can cut that check, you know, and help fund legal services. Uh, it's an option. So we try to make pro bono really easy for every practicing attorney in Virginia. And when we go back to uh, the 2% of professional time, what that really translates to is about 40 hours per year. That's what we're saying. So we're not a mandatory pro bono state. 
you know, pro bono, actually, if you make pro bono mandatory, it kind of defeats the purpose. It's no longer pro bono, it's, you know, you're being asked and being told to do this. But it is strongly encouraged that every lawyer, regardless of what they do, their prominence or their workload, try to provide some sort of legal assistance to folks who cannot afford counsel. And the uh, comment basically says, it could be one of the most rewarding experiences in the life of a lawyer. And truly, the stories that I hear and based on personal experience, I can tell you it is very rewarding to do it. Now, in terms of the types of uh, pro bono services that can be provided, again, poverty law, civil rights law, public interest law, and voluntary activities. Poverty law is exactly that. If you have a client who cannot afford representation, if you provide, agree to provide that representation for free or at nominal cost, that is considered pro bono. And when it comes to defining what poverty is, you know, there are guidelines, legal aid offices have certain guidelines, other uh, organizations that provide pro bono reps that have certain guidelines for poverty. But when it comes to you as a lawyer, if you're going to do it on your own, you really use your own judgment because sometimes, you know, you may have a client who doesn't qualify for legal aid or someone who asks you for assistance who may not qualify for legal aid, but they can't afford to pay you as a lawyer. If you do that service for free or at a nominal cost, that's good pro bono. That's, that's considered pro bono. So, you know, do that. The one thing that is important to note is that the pro bono relationship has to be established up front. It's not one of those things where after the fact, you, you, you're trying to get paid by your client, your client says, I can't pay you, it's like, oh, I'll write this off. You know, that's a nice thing to do, that's not pro bono. Pro bono, the importance of the relationship is that both the attorney and the client understand up front that there is not going to be an exchange of funds or compensation involved in it. A second type of pro bono representation is civil rights law. And again, it involves the representation of providing assistance to victims of discrimination based on race, sex, age, uh, you know, or any sort of uh, at-risk group who, is, who have their rights threatened. If you provide that service or representation for free or again at a nominal cost, established up front, that is good for pro bono. Public interest law, again, free nominal fee representation to religious, charitable, civic groups, you know, great way to do pro bono. And again, the rule, even the comment, provides examples, setting up shelter for the homeless, operating outline for battered spouses, etc. Um, you know, and again, uh, and I put my own little note in there, that's not part of the rule or comment, is that it seems that the examples here point to working with vulnerable populations, but the rule does not explicitly state this. So, you know, while it, you know, it, it's good, again, to provide legal representation, let's say, to um, the orchestra, that's great. Um, it's probably not public interest law because the orchestra may have many needs, but when it comes to them actually being a vulnerable population or group, I, I would argue that they probably aren't. Voluntary pro bono service is another way to you know, provide pro bono, basically the voluntary activities. What that means is this, is that okay, I work in an office, they really don't allow me to do pro bono, um, I'm a government lawyer, you know, something like that. How can I help? You can train. You can mentor a lawyer. You can recruit lawyers. You know there you, you, there are ways to provide assistance that you know maybe not direct representation, but can assist someone who cannot afford counsel to get the representation they need. And certainly training lawyers, you have this knowledge, you have this skill set. You know conduct a CLE, speak at a CLE. You know, all of that would be great. The rule or the comment also speak to contingent fees. And uh, you all have seen the commercial, I don't get paid if you don't get paid, you know, so if you don't get paid, I don't get paid a cent. Um, you know, that's not pro bono. Because there is the expectation by the lawyer who provides the representation that he or she is going to get paid at some point. We're going to win this case and I'm going to get paid. No, 
The service must be provided without fee or expectation of fee, and the intent of the lawyer providing the service is at the heart of this, and the understanding of the, uh, the party being represented. Now, the ABA model rule also addresses pro bono. Their 6.1 is slightly different than the Virginia rule. First of all, uh, they're specific uh, in terms of the number of hours, or the minimum number of hours that a lawyer should provide. They say 50 hours. And they lay out the same basic categories of, of, uh, of or types of representation that can be provided. The person's a limited mean, charitable, religious, civic community, organizations, etc. They also uh, talk about, I've got this highlighted here, but in addition to the pro bono representation, they say that you should also provide financial support. So it is a both and. It is a service and it is financial support. According to the ABA, the Virginia rule, it's either or. You, know, you can do the 2% or you can make a financial contribution. And I talked earlier about the collective works again. You know, in order to meet this obligation, law firms or law offices can pool their collective pro bono works and assign it for a lawyer will voluntarily accept the responsibility to provide that representation. The financial support um, says uh, direct financial support to programs that provide direct delivery of legal services that will help to provide representation to the poor. The one thing I will note in this is that the comment basically provides that the amount of financial contribution should be in proportion to their professional income. So how I read that is that the rule suggests 2% of your professional time. I would read this comment as saying that 2% of your professional income should also go to that, uh, providing that type of uh, support of legal services. Don't ask me if that's gross or net. I'm not going to get into that. I don't know. It's like anything and everything is helpful. So what's going on here in Virginia? The numbers, and these numbers are actually from, uh, the source of these numbers come from a few different sources. We do not uh, basically collect data on pro bono. Some states actually have that as part of their bar renewal. You have, there's a question on there, how many hours of pro bono service did you provide? You know, how much money did you contribute? Virginia's not there yet, and I'll get to that momentarily. Um, but these numbers basically come from a variety of sources. One, legal aid actually does tally the numbers, uh, the hours that are provided by attorneys who accept cases through them. And so uh, these numbers are from 2013. And uh, I have to uh, acknowledge uh, John Whitfield, who is the executive director of Blue Ridge Legal Services, because he has really undertaken a uh, process of gathering this information. And, and putting it together and making it available so that uh, really all of us can realize what's happening here. But um, as you can see, 35,000 cases uh, were uh, closed last year or in 2013. Almost 41,000 of them were handled by legal aid. The private bar handled pretty much the remaining cases. Um, so roughly, what, 12% of those cases were handled by private attorneys through pro bono. The Access to Legal Services Committee of the Virginia State Bar, my committee, uh, sent out a survey also in 2013 of the non-legal aid organizations, um, asking them to basically, if they gather this information, to share it with us and, and tell us you know, what sort of pro bono services are being provided. Uh, this survey indicated that about 2,100 attorneys participate in pro bono activity, both through the legal aid and independent pro bono programs. Regionally, Northern Virginia's tops with about 1,000 attorneys, 500 in the Richmond area. Uh, from a percentage standpoint, the Valley region, the Roanoke Valley, uh, the area around uh, the Blue Ridge Legal Services actually, which uh, is incredibly impressive as 17% of their attorneys are involved in some sort of pro bono representation, which is great. That's outstanding. 
10% uh, in Central Virginia, about 8% in Northern Virginia. So of the cases handled, 5,400 were handled to completion on a pro bono or reduced fee basis, and there are the numbers there, 2,200 in the Central Region, 1,800 in Northern Virginia, 600 in the Valley, and the total amount of hours that were donated statewide per legal aid and per the data given by the independent pro bono organizations was about 36,000 hours, or about 1.6 pro bono hours per attorney in Virginia, um, which is a far cry from the 40 hours that uh, the rule sets forth as kind of the standard. Um, if every member of the bar who was admitted to practice in Virginia were compliant with the 2% rule, we would have had over 900,000 hours of pro bono representation statewide. So are we in crisis? Absolutely. How much pro bono is occurring outside of the legal aid programs? Again, we don't know. Legal aid keeps the data. Some of the independent organizations keep the data, you know, but because there is no reporting requirement in Virginia, we don't know. You know, it is safe to assume that lots of lawyers are doing ad hoc pro bono in the state. You know, there's no denying that. I'm not sure of that. But, well, I'm almost, almost at the point where I would bet my salary that it's not going to make up the 850,000 hour difference. You know, I think it's safe to assume that we're not there. So how do we get there? Why, why, why is this gap existing? Why are attorneys doing pro bono work? Well, the ABA did a survey in 2013 in their Supporting Justice 3 report where they asked this question of attorneys. And those who responded, their top answers were this. They didn't do pro bono because of time constraints, because of commitment to family obligations, because they don't, didn't feel comfortable practicing in certain areas of the law, that you know their work uh, situation, they have too many billable hours, then they can't, you know, they get in trouble for doing it. You know, it's just the cost of burden, for, especially in a yeah, solo practitioner or you know, in a small office. And to do 40 hours of work would just be a disaster. You know, I don't have a law clerk, a secretary, or whatever to assist me with pro bono, and I don't have malpractice insurance. Actually, let me go back to that. The thing about it is this, is that in spite of all that, we can address pretty much every one of them. There is a way to address this. Let's start with number seven, work our way up. The lack of malpractice insurance. If you do pro bono through a legal aid office, you will be covered under their policy. That's the great thing about legal aid, is that they will provide that coverage. That support will be there, and you will be covered if you take a case through them. The administrative support, well, you know, again, taking a case through legal aid. And I'm going to push that legal aid option because that's the best way because they can pretty much address everything that's being, that was, that was cited here as a reason for not doing pro bono, they can get you there. Administrative support, well they do have support staff there who can help you, plus let me, let me just say this, even if they don't have support staff, they've got memos, they've got motions, they've got resources there that they are happy to share with you to assist you in your representation. The cost of financial burden on the practice. Well, if you're not starting from square one with the case, and you've got most of the information, the motions, and everything there, that is actually a cost-saving and time-saving factor. The competing billable hour expectations and policies. Well, you know, this is more of a, really an issue in terms of what is the benefit of pro bono to me as a practitioner. If you look on Google and look at a lot of the, uh, or even the white pages, the yellow pages, rather, Lawyers cite their pro bono work. I mean, you know what? It's, it's a great way to, you know, promote yourself as a lawyer to say that I'm doing pro bono. And the state bar and other organizations recognize and reward pro bono service by lawyers. And in fact, we're about to engage at the state bar an expanded and more extensive um, acknowledgement and recognition program of pro bono lawyers. We're going to start a program, you'll see it in the upcoming issue of Virginia Lawyers, something called the Access to Justice Hero. 
program where we're asking for stories about you know pro bono experiences that lawyers have had, talking, giving them an opportunity to really you know, lawyers like to talk about them, so we do like to do that. So why not do it and have you know this forum where you can celebrate not only your work but the cause that you're supporting. You know, commitment to family obligations. You know, a lot of us have families. But the fact is, is that there are different ways to do pro bono. Most of it, and let me just say this, with legal aid, the cases you get out of legal aid are not big, huge, complex cases. I think everybody, or at least a lot of the attorneys I've talked to are scared of getting the pro bono case. You know, it's a contested custody case. It's going to go on forever. No. Where legal aid needs help most are what is called low-hanging fruit. Uncontested divorces. They've got uncontested divorces all over the place that they that desperately call for someone to assist them. They have landlord-tenant cases which are easily resolved. Two years at most. You know, get in and out, and you provide an assistance to someone who's desperately in need of legal representation. So, you know, they're not going to give you the hard case. You can ask for it if you want a hard case. I'm sure they'd be happy to share them. But where they really need help, especially after losing 20% of their staff, are on those cases. Because guess what? The cases are still coming in. And yes, they are turning, they have to turn people away. But the fact is, is that these offices need the assistance of volunteer lawyers. The uh, pro bono study did suggest uh, a number of strategies, including providing education, about pro bono assistance and what pro bono means, um, educating lawyers on the uh, legal needs of the poor, developing additional mentoring resources, increasing the employer encouragement and support of pro bono, you know, making it easier through rules and policies such as you know limited scope representation. Uh, support of government lawyers or support to government lawyers and corporate lawyers to provide some sort of pro bono assistance. You know, again, it doesn't have to be direct representation. Sorry, it doesn't have to be direct representation. It can be, you know, uh, again, participating in training, doing a, a program like this is a great way to provide pro bono assistance, even though you're not directly representing a client. Expanding the range and types of of uh, representational option. Legal aid offices, unfortunately, a lot of them are limited to the types of cases they can handle. But there are other organizations that do provide and target, you know, issues for pro bono assistance, and several of them, or a number of them, are represented here today. So, you know, there, there are ways to get the type of case that appeals to you, or if you want to try something different, be it legal aid, be it, you know, independent legal services organizations. They're, they're all good. Again, educating the lawyers, free or reduced fee continuing legal education as an incentive for pro bono services, something that is near and dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, making sure that you, you do a good job of matching the case type with the expertise and comfort level of the lawyers providing. As I said, you know, no one is going to basically throw you to the lions with pro bono. If you if you do it ad hoc, you know, that's on you. But if you go to a legal aid office or you go to a, you know, any of these independent legal services organizations, they will make sure that there is a nice, comfortable fit and not get you in above your comfort level. Um, so how can we close the pro bono gap? There's a few things going on in Virginia I'd like to share with you. First of all, the Chief Justice of the Virginia Supreme Court every other year conducts a pro bono summit. And that's an event where basically all sorts of organizations, legal aid, independent organizations, the bar, the, 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 in the, uh, the uh, state and local bar associations, all of them, especially bars, all come together and we talk about what's going on in terms of pro bono in Virginia. It's a celebration. The Access to Justice Commission recently established, established uh, uh, a year ago, coming up on a year. Um, again, an initiative of the Supreme Court of Virginia, but 
they have a committee that is devoted to looking at ways to make pro bono easier for the attorneys who do it and more accessible for the folks who need it. The Access to Legal Services Committee, that's my committee. Basically, we develop policies concerning issues of pro bono, legal aid, to a lesser extent, indigent defense, and even pro se. But we want to make sure that people who need lawyers get lawyers. Our committee has 15 members on it. They represent all regions of the state. They represent really all types of practice areas from, you know, we've got a, basically a former clerk of court on there. We've got several firm lawyers. We've got several legal aid lawyers. We've got solo practitioners. Every, uh, towards the end of each uh, year, uh, we invite folks to submit applications and statements of interest. We would love to have you. If you have any interest in being involved in, in, in the policy side of pro bono, please apply. And if you have any questions about it, contact me. Firms and service, this is a model that has taken root in Bridgman. There's also an uh, ongoing firms and service organization or, or, or group here in Northern Virginia. And Tidewater is also building one in which basically the large firms get together and they strategize and develop uh, plans and approaches for increasing the availability of pro bono service through their lawyers. Justice Server, a wonderful tool that again is in the process of expansion, but basically it's like, um, what is it? Uh, essentially, what's the online dating service? I'm, I'm blanking on it, but that, that's basically what it is, is that you, know, you say, you know, I want to do pro bono, this is the type of case I want. They will match you with a client who has that needs. And in addition to making that match, they have training resources online. It is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It is basically right now pretty much centralized in, in Central Virginia, so Charlottesville and Greater Richmond, but it is expanding. And I think Northern Virginia is actually the next uh, target uh, for justice serve. So, you know, again, if you're from Central Virginia or just, you know, heck, they will help match you or at least help identify opportunities in Northern Virginia, even though they may not have clients in Northern Virginia, they can help match you with, you know, uh, an organization that can find you a client. And then there's pro bono partnerships. Um, you know, again, Harrisonburg Rockingham being, I think, the gold standard when it comes to pro bono in Virginia, their bar association has a partnership with their local legal aid that works tremendously. And again, when you've got almost 20% of the lawyers in that region actively engaged in pro bono, I mean, you know, that, that's terrific. So what can you do? If you're part of an organization, of course, you can support existing pro bono programs with legal aid. You can promote pro bono by co-sponsoring a training on pro bono issues or participate in a drive to recruit pro bono lawyers. If you're a lawyer, this is your legal aid office. Contact them. They will sign you up. You know, and even if you don't want to take a case, there's other things that you can do. They need help in all sorts of ways. Answering phones, screening cases, you know, doing research, helping them write bylaws. All of this is stuff that, you know, this is stuff that you can do as a pro bono lawyer that will ultimately benefit a client who cannot afford counsel. You can get cases through programs like the Virginia SIJ Project, and in just a moment, I'm going to turn over the floor to Nick Meritz, and he will tell you about this program, which is a wonderful initiative that the State Bar is very proud to be a partner with. Um, also, there's programs like the Legal Information Network for Cancer, the Community Tax Law Project, I mentioned Justice Server, Just Neighbors, the VBA, Veterans Issue Camp. There are a variety of existing projects that are out there that you know either you can conduct your research and, and find one that appeals to you or I'll, I'll offer this I'll save you the effort call me I'll look them up for you I'm happy to do that and then just you know encourage your firm if you're part of a firm to be more friendly to pro bono <coughs> because ultimately you know while it seems like oh we're losing an attorney to, to be doing billable hours they will benefit too because they can sell this to clients. Clients like to see that their firms, 
that they, that they, they hire are about more than just money, that they have a community engagement, involvement, and so pro bono gets you there. Nick, um, at this point, why don't I turn it over to you for a moment or two, if you don't mind, and, and tell folks about the Virginia SIJ project. I'm in court, so I don't have to use all your time, which is great. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much, Carl, for that uh, presentation. Uh, Carl and I have been corresponding about the Virginia SIJ project for oh, a couple of months now, and it's great to finally uh, meet so many people who are involved in, in uh, who are interested in this issue who I haven't had the chance to meet yet. Uh, so my name is Nicholas Merritt, and I work with uh, the Legal Aid Justice Center in the Northern Virginia office in Falls Church. And right now we uh, have received uh, a lot of interest in SIJ since uh, we've been setting up a statewide project to match uh, unaccompanied children from Central America who have been coming here without one or both of their parents, finding them legal aid representation uh, both in uh, family courts, in juvenile domestic relations district court, and then in the uh, immigration courts. Uh, the model that we found uh, that's been quite successful is, uh, although most of the uh, SIJ cases have been coming to Northern Virginia, there are a lot uh, in Central Virginia and uh, even some of the places further out west. Virginia is the fifth largest receiving state for these children after they, when they cross the border, they're placed into uh, custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, part of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, until they're released to a sponsor, usually a, a, family, a family member or a friend, while they're waiting for their immigration court date. So we know that there, there are, uh, I think it's close to 5,000 children who have been placed, uh, uh, who have come unaccompanied to Virginia just in the, in the last, uh, last fiscal year and what's the beginning of this one. So the need is enormous. We found that uh, family lawyers don't necessarily feel comfortable practicing in immigration court, and immigration uh, lawyers uh, around Northern Virginia don't want to schlep all the way up from the northern, from the D.C. suburbs all the way down to Roanoke or to Tidewater uh, to meet with clients on a weekly basis, although that's usually not the kind of frequency that we'd ask for no matter where the client is. So we found that splitting the, the project between family lawyers and immigration lawyers has really been a successful model that's uh, starting to bear fruit. We're getting our, our first family court uh, predicate orders and taking them over to immigration court. So it's, a, a, it's an exciting time to get involved. And uh, I take it that everyone here has some familiarity with the basics of, of what special immigrant juvenile status is. If, if, there any, if, there any, if there's anyone uh, who doesn't raise your hand, just kidding. I won't push you on the spot like that. Especially if you speak Spanish, I would love to talk with you at any point during this present, uh, during the day today, about how we can get you more involved, uh, whether on the immigration side, uh, the family court side, or both. It's a project that's given me a lot of uh, a lot of joy. I love meeting with kids, and I love working with attorneys. So uh, I'm happy and, and anxious to plug as many of you into this project as possible, to help get some benefit for some unaccompanied children, and uh, keep families together. So thanks very much, Carl, for uh, those couple of minutes and. Again, I'm here. Um, I'll be here all day. We are very excited to be partnering with uh, Nick. He uh, he brings a lot of energy to this project, which is growing and expanding. The project started actually it it, 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 it it rose out of one of the free CLE programs that the bar helped put on in October of last year to really recruit lawyers and provide some training on uh, SIJ issues and uh, that project resulted in or that training rather resulted in the SIJ project and at least at last my understanding was that some 50 juveniles have received representation as a result of the project we're trying to blow that up big time and so uh, starting actually next month we're going to be doing a training uh, actual seminar uh, with the uh, local bar associations to start actively recruiting more attorneys to do this and hit the ground you know webinars are great because you get information out there quickly but you lose that kind of face-to-face -face, person to person appeal so hopefully the seminars will allow us to make even stronger con uh, connections with the uh, private lawyers so um I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation so basically i've been on the job now for about 18 months, and uh, I've looked at Virginia, and I, I see Virginia is just, just right with uh, pro bono opportunities and, and the ability to expand 
uh, pro bono and provide representation for those Virginians who really, really desperately need it. Every day, every day I get at least one or two, maybe even three calls from somebody saying, you know, Mr. Doss, I have this issue. I need this assistance. Can you help me? And unfortunately, I'd say more than half of them have already been turned down by legal aid. So where do we go? Where can I send them? It's like, you know, there, there are the, as I said, the independent pro bono organizations, but some of them are limited, of course, by subject matter. Some of them are limited by, you know, region or ge uh, geography. And in areas like Southwest Virginia or Southside, where you've got legal aid and pretty much that's it, you know, I have nowhere to send them. So, you know, I'm doing the same thing that they may have already done or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe should have done is I'm hitting the yellow pages and I'm hitting Google and trying to see who's down there who says that they're willing to do pro bono cases and trying to get that information to them. But, you know, I'm not, I don't make referrals. I can't say that this lawyer will represent you. I may actually refer them to, uh, you know, the, the basically lawyer referral service. But again, there's a fee involved with that. It's uh, $35 for a 30 minute consultation. And there's no guarantee that after that 35 minutes that that relationship is going to continue. And if it does, whether that attorney would do it pro bono. So, you know, we are in crisis. But as I said, you know, 18 months on the job here has given me at least a, a need to be optimistic about things. So we do the imaginative thing. So imagine if every lawyer in Virginia just did two hours. At that point, we doubled the pro bono that is currently being performed to the best of our knowledge in Virginia. Two hours per year. That's two hours per year. What is this? this is, what, 10 minutes a week? Something like that? You know, it, 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 it's, it's not much time. If they do two hours per month, we're at 600,000 hours of pro bono service. That's a chunk of change. We're getting, and now we're, we're competing with, you know, Maryland and competing with, you know, Texas even. And so where they got big numbers. If we can get every lawyer to do two hours per week, 2.5 million hours of pro bono service. That's not a lot of time for lawyers to assist, to provide that type of assistance. We will have just crushed the aspirational goal. The Supreme Court will be like so giddy that they'll probably have to rule and say, okay, let's do 4% of your professional time. But we don't need to go there. You know, the bottom line is this, is that I'm appealing to you. If you can do pro bono service in any capacity, please do it. The bar, and specifically, I'm here to help you. I want to make it easy for you. I will guide you to resources and opportunities. I want to celebrate your achievements. If you are doing pro bono service, let me know, and I will make sure that you get the promotion and the thanks that you so richly deserve. The fact is, is that, you know, as lawyers, we, we've been given really a tremendous opportunity to help. And I love money as much as anybody else, but the fact is, is that we all see, if we, if we, if we didn't see the need, we need to be aware of the need that's out there. Because there are a lot of folks who are desperately in need of your assistance. I'm here for the whole day, so if you have any questions, or I guess I may have a minute or two, but otherwise, catch me afterwards. I do have the brochures, and uh, if you do want an issue of the magazine, first of all, I've got one issue here. I'm, it's my issue, but you can have it. Like I said, I've got boxes full of them, and I hope you uh, contact me for pro bono service. Thank you, Jim.